There are a lot of approaches that have been tried. The hardest thing for scientists to realize is that the first approach, which is what they always, oops, I didn't mean that, uh, which is what they always want to do is probably the worst of it. And when scientists come to you and suggest it, I have enough experience to tell you it's no good. What happens is the obvious thing. Scientists give long, boring speeches. The crazies at either end of the issue grab the microphones and yell at each other for the rest of it. They may ask a question, in which case every scientist has to answer the question, <laughs> giving every thought they've ever had about it, and it's a disaster. What's hard about it is, as you all know better than I, engagement is an interactive process, and it's hard, and it's intensive, it's time consuming, and it's very difficult. This is a principle I just threw into this talk. This is another new slide, probably in the wrong place. But it, you know, it, it's interesting because the temptation is to say, I want to do public outreach engagement, and I want to do it about what I'm interested in. But in my experience, other than drugs, which everybody's interested in, or you know, depression, people want to talk about things that are locally meaningful or personally meaningful and you need to have a subject, and you need to have a subject that will, in fact, uh, be true and that will be a, of interest. And of course, there's that word that I learned uh, from the former director of the Mexico Science Museum, one of my favorite words, and you'll be pleased to know that although it's a part of all of your um, own uh, speaking patterns, every time I've used that word, people go, <gasps> So could you just do that, because I like it. <laughs> Thank you. So you know what local means. Um, and, and it is the realization that, uh, in fact, people only care about things that affect them personally or that affect them locally. And you all do global better than anybody. And I just saw Emily Toster before I use uh, Liberty Science Center is the example where I had the wonderful experience of watching a kid in Newark, or near Newark, stick his hand into a swamp exhibit, pull it out, and go, I live there. And it was just one of those fabulous sort of experiential things I loved. It. But I've seen other science centers do it as well, so please don't hate me for not mentioning yours. Um, I think that science centers are the ideal partners with the scientific community in order to do public engagement. And it is true, whether you experience it or not, that scientists love science centers. Most scientists I know brag about going, being a part of, or even though you don't get them volunteering, they think they are. They love coming to science centers. It's obvious the public loves it. And importantly, I have the sense that the public trusts science centers. They're safe places for discussing tough issues. They actually expect you, within reason, to take on tough issues. Um, in fact, I had a post this morning in the uh, Huffington Post about science centers. And see, that was for you. Uh, and and um, it, it was actually about the decision made by the National Museum of Natural History to do basically an evolution-based exhibit on human origins. It could have been incredibly controversial, but uh, is beautifully done if you've seen it, and uh, is the epitome of what I think of as a science center. I don't know what they think of but a, a science center, in fact, uh, doing a pretty risky but pretty important kind of thing. And there are an array of places you all know this better than I do. This is an obvious list, um, but it's true. I see science centers as an ideal place to do these things. Um, and I think that if we work together, we can do one thing that I mentioned First, uh, and that is that every most scientists I know say that they got a lot of their inspiration in two ways. One is from having a research experience, 
as a high school student or an undergraduate. The second is going to a science center. My own was, you know, I'm in love with the heart at the Franklin Institute. I come from Philadelphia. And in fact, I think there are ways that we can continue to do that. But I also think that we can do a lot of things that, in fact, do a better job of leveraging each other's expertise. Obviously, you are experts at public interaction and education. Uh, we can help with speakers and content consultants. And then, I had, this is one of today's slides. I had the thought that what we ought to do, because the only way to do this public engagement well is in fact to bring together not only scientists and museum types, but scientists, ethicists, we're going to do ethical values issues, lawyers. Hank Greeley gave the talk today in the neuroscience session. He's a law professor who does neuroethics. Fabulous guy who works with the courts on very tough issues that you could have to deal with communication experts, engagement experts, and then I added public stakeholders. So one of the things I'm hoping will come out of this partnership that we're going to be developing is a way to use our common convening expertise to bring this kind of array of people together to help do what we both agree we need to do. So some of you who have experience are thinking, are scientists going to deliver, or is this an empty promise? Well, one of the nice things that have happened is what's called broader impacts. Now, I understand those of you who have experience with NSF granting understand that um, nobody knows what broader impacts means, but, but in a way, it means working with you. NASA has a similar one. And it can include public outreach or engagement. I'm a member of the National Science Board, and we do have a task force at the moment looking at the review criteria. Most of this is around that issue, and I can tell you that at least some of us are very committed to trying to translate that into real kinds of activities where in meaningful ways we could, in fact, build better collaborations between scientists and science centers. This is one of my new favorite lines. Lip service is better than no service, but not much. And one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of the outreach stuff that people have been doing is not selling anymore. And I got this quote from Cora Merritt, uh, who I think it speaks for itself. But I think it's exactly on the mark. And I think we should exploit it, frankly. Uh, so they don't totally want to do it, eh, that's okay. The secret is we can make use of whatever their motivation may be. It is true that, that there are many scientists that do these kinds of things. Sadly, this is a study in the United Kingdom, not in the United States, but some 74% claim to have been a part of it. You can read as well as I. Many are, in fact, engaging in some kind of what they think of as public outreach or, or broader impact. Um, and it's interesting that the barriers reported in the UK are not dissimilar to those in the United States. I will tell you that I, in my generation of scientists, when I left the bench 30 years ago, and I've spent the last 30 years doing, among other things, a fair amount of, of public communication, engagement, um, my mentor said, you know, you could have stayed in the lab and written five more papers, and then you'd be a real scientist. Um, and I, I think it is a big issue. This says only 20% uh, think that they're less well regarded, but I can tell you that more and more people are valuing public outreach, and in particular, young scientists want to do it. A problem, of course, is it's not an innate skill. It's a learned skill. And we don't do training in, as a part of public, as part of graduate education. And um, scientists don't get it. So it has to be trained. This, I like this. Have I shown this to you guys before? I don't think so. I love this. 
chart, okay? This is how scientists communicate and how the public receives stuff. And I think it's terrific. I didn't invent it. This is a slide of my colleague, Ginger Penholster. So, okay, so scientists like to tell a story, you know? I think I'll build it. And then, if you can stay with it, you'll get to the conclusion. <laughs> The public, on the other hand, wants to start with the bottom line, and so what, then they'll take the details. That disconnect is a big, it's not a small one, and it's one that has to be worked with. And as you, I hope, know, we have a training program that uh, my colleague Tiffany Lowater uh, runs that, in fact, has been going around the country training young scientists in how to communicate, how to engage with the public, and it is amazingly popular. How many have we done? Fifteen. Fifteen of these workshops. We have trained well over a thousand scientists, and over 70% are what are called young scientists, because they are interested in doing it, and their older mentors are not. But you are experts, and I believe can teach scientists a great deal. So, okay. That was a long speech. I apologize for its length, a little. Um, how do we do it, and how do we stop talking about it and actually put it into place? Well, individual scientists and in individual science centers will continue to collaborate, and if there's a way we can help broker that, we would be happy to do it. I don't know exactly how to do it, but I'm sure we could collectively figure out how to do that. And It'll be one of the things Bud and I are talking about as we go forward. I think that we should be exploiting our respective organizations to try to develop these kinds of issues at a broad level. Whoops, don't look at that. <laughs> one, one of the things is to do this convening thing, and that is to bring together collectively, find the issue. Find the issue that you think is coming up, and, and I don't care how you do that, but you are on the front line far more than the scientific community is. We are almost always reactive. So these neuroscience issues are an interesting one because you don't want to precipitate a problem. So if we go out and start talking a lot about these neuroscience issues, we could make it into a problem when it isn't a problem yet. <laughs> Having said that, you guys know how to frame issues in a way that, in fact, is much more effective with the public. And as the discussion earlier today decided, in some of your presence, but most of your absence, uh, in fact, science centers working with the neuroscience community and the neuroethics community could, in fact, figure out how to frame these issues so you can have a brain exhibit and don't get a big surprise. Take my word for it, you could have a big surprise. You may think it's just about clicky clickies, but it isn't, it's about minds and souls. And it, and it will be an issue. I just use that as an example, that if we found a topic that you collectively or individually felt was a big one coming, and we took the time to work out the, the plan, use the lead time, we could come up with a strategy. You could help figure out how to frame it, how to express it. We could help with the content part, and we could bring in the other people who have the expertise we need, because even though we are really smart scientists and science center people, we don't know everything. So, now, I love this. I will tell you, I didn't make that one. Somebody made it for me a few years ago, and I use it in a variety. You want to see it again? <laughs> you get the point? It isn't a political statement. It's, it's about mice pushing an elephant over the hill. And that's what we collectively have to be doing. And I do think that if we decide we're going to be mice together, we'll do better than mice alone. One more time. Thank you. <laughs>